Yes, testing one, two. Here we go. Right there? Yeah. All right, here we go. Good morning. Welcome to Simple Truth Church. Absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning. It's pretty amazing. Yesterday, we, the smoke woke us up. This morning, the wind woke us up, but no smoke. Just gorgeous. It's good to be here this morning. Trust you all had a great week. We had a great week. Had the privilege of officiating the uh, wedding of Jared and Casey. Yeah. That was awesome. That was a great evening. And then we dedicated little Marion at the same time, which is awesome. What a cutie. <clears throat> so, here we are. We have a few announcements this morning. And uh, remember, you can fill out the prayer requests back there by the agape box. Get those filled out. And put them in there, or you can call us anytime. You can text us anytime. And then you can uh, visit our website, and you can see links that are provided to, so you can go on to Facebook Live and uh, watch this, or, or you can go to YouTube and watch it afterwards. And then you can also join us on uh, Facebook Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock for Pastor Tommy. He's going through Mark, the book of Mark. And... Uh, six o'clock and then we've also uploaded those messages onto uh, YouTube so you can watch them afterwards which is really nice and then uh, women's Tuesday morning uh, prayer again it's at uh, Karen Kenny's house and you can get a hold of Karen or, or Jan Hagel to get directions out there and then emergency prayer chain Susie Sagan there's her cell phone number you can call or text her. And then uh, see what else is going on here. Men are meetings on uh, Friday mornings on Zoom. You can get a hold of Sagan, Steve Sagan, or Bill McIntosh if you'd like to get invited to that. And then as far as uh, prayer requests go, we... Uh, want to continue to pray for Jared Amanda's Uncle Jess. And then Isaac Reiswig, they, his uh, results came back from that biopsy, and it turns out that he has a really rare form of cancer, and, uh, which is mind-blowing to me and to him, too. It's like, wow. Uh, he's had that cough for a long time, took a lot of tests, and they figured out it was some I don't even know how to pronounce the name of it but uh, we'll continue to pray for him and he, and he still has an appointment for uh, Cedar Sinai so even though he has cancer he was going down there for a, a lung issue they they still said hey we, we still want to see you so thank God for that he gets to go down there and, and listen to those guys so they're supposed to be the best in the world so praise God for that we continue to pray for him. And then uh, Kathy Anderson Myers told me that her uh, sister-in-law, Kim, had to go to the hospital this morning for uh, kidney stones. So that's, I've never had them, but I've heard stories. And uh, so we'll pray for her. And then uh, I got a prayer request this morning also from, uh, from, uh, it was from Gail Tanquery. She said Dennis Amaral is having a biopsy on a tumor in his bronchial tube. So we need to pray for him. Yeah, that's on here too. Yeah, Bev, Shoot. uh, Bev Shoots. Yeah, she uh, fell down and, and broke her shoulder. You know, she's a caregiver for several people. So that's terrible. I was thinking about, you know, if you're, because we're, li we're living in these tents, and our tents wear out, 
And you know how it is when you live in a tent. If, you, if, if the tent pole breaks, then you get smothered by the tent. So I was thinking, well, at least her tent pole didn't break. Because that's never good. It's not good to have a broken shoulder either, but at least the tent's still up. So uh, we'll, we'll pray for her. And uh, that's, yeah, that's not good. Let's see what else is going on. Continue to pray for uh, Bardo's cousin, Jamie Rose, who has uh, ALS. Michael W. Smith's son, who's doing better. And then uh, Nancy Berger and Sarah Fink, Dave McGurr, Chris Como, our unsaved loved ones. Definitely our, uh, our country and our leaders, as well as our armed forces and uh, first responders. Always a privilege to be able to pray for them. And I've heard from a couple people that talked to uh, Isaiah Camacho yesterday and the day before, and he's doing really well. The Camachos were at that uh, national day of prayer yesterday in Washington, D.C. And uh, I know Ken asked him how his grades were. You know, he's at Annapolis. And uh, he said, you did get straight A's, right? And he said, well, I got a B and a B plus, and the rest were A's. So it's like, Isaiah, Isaiah, dude, B's? <laughs> wow. Yeah, Ken was so disappointed. I used to hope, maybe, by accident, I could get a B. So, good job, Isaiah. <laughs> and sometimes by accident, I got Bs in uh, PE or something, you know. Wood shop. Anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning. And Lord, it is an, a privilege to be able to come here and worship you, be able to come to a public school and worship you. Lord, we're thankful for the rights that we have and the, those that serve our country to protect our rights. They give us this freedom that we're able to enjoy. Just pray that you would pour out your blessing upon them, pour out your grace upon them. Lord, that you'd keep them safe. Pray that as well for our first responders. We thank you for the firefighters and Law enforcement, Lord, we thank you for the peace and tranquility we enjoy because of our local law enforcement and firefighters, first responders. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray for uh, those that are sick among us. And Lord, we know, we know you're an amazing God. We know you're the great physician. We know that you could just reach inside of, of people and fix them, Lord. I was, I was thinking about that this morning, that you could just reach right inside of Isaac Riseweg and just fix him. And Lord, I pray that, and we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would do that. And Lord, we know if it's your will, you will. We pray that it would be your will. We pray that for all those that we've mentioned today in our prayer requests and, and those that, that we haven't mentioned. Think about Pastor Rudy, Lord, the things that you're doing in his life, and pray that you continue to heal him, Lord, and he would continue to be the bright light that he is in his community. Lord, we pray for those that uh, lead this country, and we ask in the name of Jesus that you would protect them as well. Lord, we pray that you would, uh, that there would be some humility. Lord, that you would give them direction. Lord, that you would give them wisdom. Lord, that you would... Uh, Lead them, guide them that, as they guide our country. Lord, I pray for, uh, as we prayed last week, that if there was a Supreme Court nominee named, or, or that you would, uh, if it was your will, that that person would be in the Supreme Court. So, Lord, I'm thinking this morning that, that we should pray for Amy Coney Barrett's protection. And uh, not only her protection, but to protect her whole family. Lord, that you would uh, just keep an eye on them, Lord, and that you would keep them safe, keep them well. Lord, I just pray that, that uh, 
again, that's your will. There's nothing that, that's going to stop it, Lord, that your will be done. And so we pray for that as well. So, Lord, as we come together this morning, we came here to eliminate outside distractions. Lord, that we could focus on who we are in Christ. And, Lord, that you would just pour out your grace upon us this morning. Lord, that you'd be blessed as we lift up our voices to you in praise and worship. Lord, that you'd be blessed as we open your word and, and worship you through your word. And so, Lord, I just pray for your presence. Lord, that we would know your presence here this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to uh, worship. There's uh, obviously, if you're staying in here, the words are going to be on the screen. If you're going outside, the words are going to be on a piece of paper or on your telephone if you received the uh, email and it has the words on your phone. So here we go.
Given you my heart and all that is within, I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams, I'm laying down my rights, I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new.
sake of you, my King. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. That's our prayer this morning. Lord, we completely and totally surrender to you. So, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would teach us this morning from your word. Instill these truths into our heart, and into our mind, into our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right on. So, good morning again. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 86. Continuing in the book of Psalm reading psalm that book like i've told you about several times and uh it's just been really cool it's been great you know especially with the craziness going on but you know just in normal life going through that book and going through the book of psalms is uh very reassuring and it's been a good time to just take this this break, and, and uh, we'll eventually start Philippians, but right now we're going to be in, in Psalm 86. Great is your steadfast love. If you want to follow along, it's a prayer of David. Starting in verse 1. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of trouble I call upon you for you to answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall shall come and worship you, or come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me, your way, O oh Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O oh Lord my God, with my whole heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life. And they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to me, your servant, and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is what uh, Bobby Blacksmith says, his little commentary on it. He says, this psalm contains a phrase found seven other times in the Bible. Namely, God is slow to anger, abounding in love. He is our great example for if anyone has the right to be angry, it is God. So what does slow to anger mean? Well, several Proverbs tell us that those who are slow to anger are better than the mighty. They have great understanding. They, they, they have great understanding. They quiet contention and calm disputes and is, is a, and is a direct result of discretion. In James' epistle, we get advice on just how we should go about the process. We're to be quick to listen, while we have two ears, slow to speak, while we have one mouth. Our anger, even when justified, must be measured and aligned with God's word. Following Jesus' lead on the, on the cross should be our goal. Instead of being angry and justifiably crushing those killing him, he said, Father, forgive them. May we always do likewise. Yeah. That's easy to read, right? 
may we always do likewise. Well, our main focus this morning in, in this psalm is going to be actually verses 8 through 10. And so I'm going to read that part of it again, and we're going to focus mostly on that. Where David said, there is, there is none like you among the gods, little g, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. So verse 10 right here, verse 10 is, is, is given as a reason when David says for or, or because. He says because you are great and do wondrous things. And so he means that God's greatness is the reason for verse 9. That all nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and, and shall glorify your name. And his greatness is also the reason for verse 8. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. So, in other words, God's greatness makes him greater and stronger than all the gods, little g. And there's a lot of gods, little g, in the universe. But he's stronger than all the gods in the universe. And God's greatness makes him stronger than all the nations in the world. So he rules the gods and he rules the nations for because he is great and does wondrous things and so he alone is God and he's God over all gods and he's God over all the nations he's God over all creation well he's God over all the universe so God is great and his greatness is unsearchable it's unknowable but not only that every Christian would agree with that but they would also agree that God is great and his greatness is the the, the essential for the, for the, and central to our lives. This is relevant to everything we think. This is relevant to everything we feel, everything we do. And it's unparable, uh, unparalleled, and you can't compare it to anything else. It's unequaled, it's unrivaled. The greatness of God is utterly and totally important in ministry. It's in our ministries, in, in the building of a church. In, in caring for people and spreading the gospel. Truth is that even if people don't know it, even if people don't know it, what they need most and are most starved for is a vision of a great God. You know, that we're spiritual cr creatures and beings and, and we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to, we're still searching for the truth and we're starved for that. And so we're also starved if we don't have it, we're starved for the fellowship with an infinitely great God. You know, I do, a lot of times when I do premarital, I, I, I tell the uh, couple, I say, you know, the, the, the woman may not be able to, the, the bride or the, the, the fiancé may not be able to put it into words, but all she really wants is somebody that would die for her, protect her, be her covering, and then be a spiritual leader. You know, if, if a guy died to his wife or, you know, was where she felt like he would, would die even physically, but also die spiritually for her, you know, not, all, not want all his needs met, but need, meet her needs, and then lead her, be a spiritual leader, that they're pretty, uh, things would be pretty cool. I mean, they'd be pretty low maintenance. Okay, we make it harder than it has to be, but that's where, where it's, we're, we're starving. You can see from these psalms, you know, that that's what the psalmists are, that, that's where they, ultimately that's what they're seeking, is, is this fellowship this, that's with this infinitely great God. See, God's greatness is totally revel, uh, relevant for everything in our life. You think about it. If we actually saw God's greatness, we wouldn't be so greedy and, and covetous, covet. Just, we wouldn't be. We, we just wouldn't be. You know, if we actually saw God's greatness, our eyes wouldn't stray after lustful images and thoughts. If we actually, if we actually saw the greatness of God. If we actually saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't spend any time watching uh, sleazy, mindless, defiling videos or things on TV. If we actually... If we actually saw the greatness of God, if we actually saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't get angry with people so easily. 
You know, and we would actually think before we spoke. We would take each thought captive as unto the Lord. If we actually saw the greatness of God, we, we wouldn't sulk and get our feelings hurt so easily in our marriages because we know the greatness of God and we, we, we know what he's called us to do in our, in our marriages as far as that it's a, you know, being a demonstration of Christ in the church. If we actually saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't worry so much. We wouldn't, we, because we know that God is great and he's sovereign. He's in control of it anyway. There's so many things that we can't be in control of. If we saw his greatness, we'd take a breath and go, okay, God, we're going to pray just like David's praying here. And we're not going to worry so much. If we actually saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't get so discouraged by the evil godlessness of our culture and, and our nation. And it's, not, it's really hard not to get discouraged, but, but we know, and we're going to see here, who's in control. If we actually saw the greatness of God, we wouldn't give into our flesh so easily. And there, there are many other, many, many other expectations unexpected good effects that come out of our lives if we keep in mind or if we could keep the greatness of, of God in the forefronts of our, of our, of our minds. And, th- and then we could lay a hold of this awesome reality that His Word talks about. So in, in other words, think of this. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It makes more sense right now with that in my mind. He says, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God. Okay, so we have an unveiled face. We're beholding the glory of God. So we're actually seeing the greatness of God. He says, when that's happening, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. See, when we see the greatness of God, then our lives are transformed to be more like God. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul says so have we seen the greatness of God you know what our neighbors what our community you know needs more than anything else from I'll say this morning to us here from simple through church but from the church is to see the glory of God and so they're going to see the glory of God through our lives and so God loves to demonstrate his greatness by shining through vessels of clay and allowing us to shine into the darkness. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. And these, this is talking about the thorn in his flesh. Remember when God gave him the thorn of his flesh in the flesh so he wouldn't think he was all that? So he wouldn't get proud? Okay, and so this is what he says. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he, Jesus, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, Paul says, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And, you know, just to touch on that for a second, you know, we've gone over this before where that thorn in his flesh was a messenger from Satan. That's what it says. He's, it's a messenger from Satan. So I don't know why a messenger from Satan would mess with his eyesight because a lot of people think that was his thorn. But a messenger from Satan would bring him a message, okay? And his message would be how weak you are. He would insult him. He would give him hardships, persecutions, and calamities, and then he says, for when I am weak, then, I, then I'm strong because God's grace is sufficient to get me through that. And so that's our thorn. You know, how many times have you left church? You know, somebody cut you off or you didn't like something your wife said between here and the, and the, and the car, you know. And, and, and how many times that messenger from Satan's going, you're not even saved. I don't even know why you even go to church. You call yourself a Christian? And so he's saying, that, no, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. But the issue is not weakness. The issue is, have we seen the greatness of God? Because, we, you know, have we been taken captive, as it were, by, by his glory, by his power and knowledge and love in such a way that, that human power, knowledge, and love loses its, its attraction, that I'm more attracted to God. 
And that's the issue of our impact in this community, that, that we have seen the greatness of God, that we know the greatness of God. You know, there's a couple of ways that God's greatness is shown right here, that David talks about it here in this text. And he's going to illustrate it from what God is doing and, and, and what God is willing to do right here. So first, the greatness of God makes him greater than all gods in verse 8, back in our text. He says, there is none like you among the gods, little g, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. So we know, big G God, there's only one. There's only one true and living God. Okay, he said, there's, he's got the little G in here. There's, there's none like you among the gods, because there's lots of those. So Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 5. He says, for, there, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on, on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, lowercase l, right? He says, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. So Paul's saying, he's meaning, hey, there's demons and there's evil spirit, there's spiritual warfare that's going on out there. In 1 Corinthians 10, 20, he says, no, I imply that what pagan sacrifice, what pagan sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not, he says, I, don't want, I do not want you to be participants with demons. That's what we're doing. In our sin, you know, when we're worshiping a small, a small G God, we're participating with demons. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says, In their case, the God of the world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then Jesus said in John 12.31, he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world, Satan, be cast out. So because of that, we can take David to mean that there's, there's a God that's greater than, than all gods. He's greater of all angels. He's greater than all demons. He's greater than all evil spirits, all principalities and powers, like we learn about in Ephesians, and rulers of this present darkness, all spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. 1 John 5, 19, it says, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John 4, 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 3, 8, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And then Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, says, And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. So the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, the, the, the Word of God can crush the devil and crush all the gods that's, that serve with him and serve him. So when we had the National Day of Prayer and Repentance yesterday, okay, and thousands of people gathered, you saw it, if you saw it on TV at the National Wall, Mall in uh, Washington, D.C., and if you didn't get to see it, you can go online, it's everywhere now, and then you can fast forward to the part you already saw or the part that might be a little boring because there were a couple parts that might have been a little boring, but... The message was amazing. And so here we go. You know, many Christian leaders across the United States, they spoke and they prayed for our country to return and, and, and repent and return to God. And so the return is, is a movement. And, and you know that it's at an appointed time, which was yesterday, a specific day that was set apart for one purpose. And the return was to return to God by coming before him coming into his presence with, in humility and sincerity and prayer and repentance. Because without repentance, without turning back to God, there can be no revival. There can be no healing. 
because we have to repent. And so, and, and what, one of the things I liked about what, what uh, Ann Graham Lott said was she says, this, is for, this isn't for them, this is for us to repent and return. And she was real clear about it. She was pretty passionate. She said, this is for us. This isn't for them because that's what we want to think, you know. The United States needs to return to God, to repent and turn to God. It's just, oh, yeah, they do. All of us do. We need to repent and return to God. Second Chronicles, and they read this yesterday probably several times, 714. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land I went to work one day years ago and this this guy he's, he was a new Christian and uh, he says hey Jeff where is God I said he's, he's in heaven he said no I, I was reading this morning 2nd Chronicles seven fourteen. he's waiting to hear from heaven so where is he if he's waiting so he can hear from heaven I said go in the other room so he goes into the break room I said where are you right now and he says in the break room I said you're right so you're hearing me from the break room and so God's in heaven and he's waiting in heaven so he's waiting to hear from heaven that's where he is anyway I guess you had to be there it's like <laughs> dude He's in heaven. But we know the United States was founded on biblical principles, but it turned away from that foundation. It's pretty unbelievable what's happened in just our lifetime. And so there must be a return to God's ways. We as a country have fallen away. We as a country have fallen away. And it's time to return to God, and it starts with one person at a time. That was a message yesterday from several people. It starts with each individual, one purpose at a time. And so each one of us needs to repent and pray that God will hear our cry and that pray that God will heal, heal our land and, and bless us for generations to come. And so we haven't, even been dis we haven't even begun to discover what God is willing to do if we focused in, in a concerted way of praying and resisting the devil in in our specific communities you know I guess if you're going to expect the whole world or the whole nation to repent then we need to expect that that would happen right here in our community Ephesians six twelve, Paul says this for we for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places so it seems likely from experiences and, and the experiences that we know, the, the experiences that we can see that are going on in, in man, of many today, that the spiritual host of, of darkness, that Satan is, is, has assigned his host of demons to specific cities, to specific neighborhoods in America, and he darkens them in such a way that, that they're held captive by this world, and it makes them very unresponse, unresponsive to the gospel. They live in the dark. And I'm sure that, that, that there's pockets of that just even in our own community, but we can see that in big pockets across the United States of America and the world. And so, but this captivity, and, and, and that's what yesterday was all about, this captivity can be broken. So we pray that God would release us from the powers of darkness, remove that evil, and make people open to spiritual things to soften their hearts. So if you go back to our text... In verse 8, Psalm 86, 8, he says, he says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, are the, uh, o Lord, nor are there any works like yours. So, again, God is great above all gods, and he can do things beyond what we, able to, what we are able to ask and, and, or think, or if we will finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so that would allow us to do battle. 
to do battle against the enemy. And the only way that we're going to do battle against the enemy is, is, first of all, by repenting, turning to God, and then spending time in His Word, because His Word is what's going to do battle. It's the sword. Okay, the second way that this text this morning shows the greatness of God is in verse 9. It says, All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. All the nations. So whenever I get discouraged in life, which would include ministry, okay, sometimes, you know, a pastor can get discouraged in ministry. You think, man, Lord, and I've talked about this lots of times, and I mean, and you've probably thought about it too. How long will the wicked prosper? You know, and then we talked about in Psalms, well, if you're thinking, hey, God, how come you don't squish that guy like a bug? And then you... The psalmist would say, yeah, well, you, you should probably ask him why he doesn't squish you like a bug. Okay, because your sin looks a lot worse on somebody else in North Korea or something, right? But whenever I get discouraged in life, which includes ministry, I, I like to turn to a passage like this to remind myself, to, to preach to myself that I'm on God's side and God can't lose, that I'm on the winning team. That I'm already a winner, right? And so he's, he, God, is greater than all the nations and, and, will, and will exercise his greatness to bring those nations to himself. God's going to do that. And, and I, so, I, so then I can say, okay, wow. I'm not even in control of that. God's going to do that. God can do that. The Great Commission can't fail. The Great Commission won't fail. And so verse 9 is a shall. It's not a may. It's a shall. It's not a might. It's a shall. That means it's a certainty. For all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, he says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So Jesus is saying it shall happen. This is going to happen. Psalm 22, verses 27 through 28, says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Your kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. It's a shall. So in other words, God is great, and his greatness is so great that he can't lose. And, and he can't be denied his inheritance. Psalm 2.8. Ask me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. That's what was going on yesterday. And Jesus said in Matthew 16.18. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So... God is building his church around the world with absolute certainty. That's happening. Psalm 86, 9, back to our text, he says, And all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. So there isn't a, a nation or a people that will be unreached and unresponsive. I mean, there's going to be people in those, there's going to be people that are absolutely going to deny we know that, but there's going to be people in those pockets that are, are going to be responsive to the gospel. So the, the, the great scene in heaven shows the elders worshiping this song of triumph to Jesus in Revelation 5.9. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So it's going to happen. We see the end of the parade right here. He's shown us that. It's going to happen. Jesus will not be denied the reward for his suffering. And we are part of something that can't fail. And that part's encouraging. And so there are reasons to believe that God is, is, is not done reviving and, and reforming and empowering and using the American church. You know, yesterday, again, that, that national call to prayer and repentance is a great example. Asking God to 
cleanse and revive the church and, and pour out his spirit on this country. And the response was awesome as God began to move and, and people began to repent and, and made professions in, in faith in Jesus and, and that, that they are followers of Christ. And this isn't a, a dream. This is a possibility that, that many people believe that God wants to do in answer to persistent, concerted, believing prayer and then faithful labor, right? Because, because it's, it's ripe for the harvest. And so we go out and we labor in truth, in the truth of the gospel. And so we're encouraged for the, for the fruit of this power in our country and we're also encouraged for this, the fruit of this power in our own community, in our own families. So we'll read that 86, verses 8 and 10 again. We'll close with this. Again, there is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All nations, all the nations, nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. It's amazing. When you, you, know, when you think about it, you see how David put it this way. The gods will be defeated. The gods, little g, are going to be defeated. And the nations are going to come and bow down and give him, big G, God. They're going to give him glory. On God's side, we can't lose. And so I'm going to close with what Bobby Blakesmith says from a different psalm. Instead of reading the same one that I read this morning having to do with this psalm, this, I, I think this one's from uh, Psalm 145, the last of David's psalm. And this is what he says. Just thinking about what we just talked about. He says, there are many reasons why David praises the Lord. But the first is because of God's greatness. There's no need to try and identify just how great he is because all the searching in the world will come up short. Remember, David even said it's unsearchable. God also merits our praise for his goodness. He treats us so much better than we deserve. The Lord is to be praised for his glorious and everlasting kingdom. David says, all should praise God for all the provisions of life especially by those who look to the Lord in their time of need. And finally, we praise God because only in Him, mercy and righteousness can, be perfectly, can perfectly coexist. It is His pure and complete that saves us for which He is to be praised. Amen? Amen. I just flipped over, and this was from a few weeks ago, but I love this. I'm going to read it. It's Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that, that for the promises, absolute promises of your word. And so, Lord, in, in, in harmony with what took place yesterday, again, we pray, Lord, that uh, you would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, those secret sins in our life that we can just cruise along and, and, and I guess just kind of forget about the greatness of God. As long as everything's cool and everything's going okay and we're enjoying our life and we can have our cake and eat it too, then we're not going to uh, confess that. But Lord, I just pray that, Holy Spirit, that you would convict us of those things and that we would come to you and ask you to forgive us of those sins. It cleanses of all unrighteousness. And Lord, that in doing so, that, that we would see your greatness and Lord, that you would enable us, you would empower us to, to uh, preach your gospel just in the way that we live, but also that, that we would be able to demonstrate your gospel in, in the darkness 
bring light to that darkness that's around us. Lord, the only way that we're going to do that is to humble ourselves and, and realize that we're all sinners and, and that we're just saved sinners and that we need to repent and, and that your mercies are new every morning, that great is your faithfulness. So, Lord, pr- I pray you continue to show your greatness, that we would know your greatness. And in knowing your greatness, that would, like the psalm said, that would change us. That would change us from the inside out and that we'd be more like you. Lord, that's what we pray this morning for Simple Truth Church, for, for everybody that's watching, everybody that's listening. Lord, for America. Lord, we just pray that, that you would show yourself great among us. Lord, that, that, that we'd be able to just brag about you because you're an amazing God, that your power is so great. Lord, that, you, that we, we're going to see your hand in, in, uh, just in the coming days, in the coming months. Lord, that we know that you're sovereign, that you're in control, that you aren't surprised by everything that's going on, that you've seen it coming. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue to pour your grace out on us. Lord, that you would have mercy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's close in a song or two.
good thing for that, right? We got that going for us, which is nice. His grace is enough. 
So God bless you guys. Have a great week. If you need anything, make sure you get a hold of us. And vice versa, if we need anything, we'll get a hold of you. And uh, we'll continue to pray for our nation, our world, and pray that God shed his grace on us and that we would return, we would repent, and uh, look for God's greatness. So all right, you guys, again, thank you, and uh, help us stack chairs.